ان الحمد لله وحده الصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم all peace be to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> and his countless mercy and blessings be upon the prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we know that the basic the basic source of deen the original source of deen is the quran and the sunnah quran gives us the the we can say the foundational teachings and in the hadith we find the explanation of it in the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam it forms the overall structure of our deen so hadith is important in a way that it gives us a practical approach or it interprets the quran in a practical way so there is no escape from the hadith today we are going to discuss about one of the important thing which is again is the hadith hadith is we can say is a law and there is a parallel legislation against the hadith that is bid'ah that is innovation and today we are going to understand we are going to learn about the basic concept of bid'ah or the innovation or what are the aqsam the types of the innovation permissible impermissible and whatever it is in the wherever there is sunnah it takes away the bid'ah wherever there is bid'ah it takes away the sunnah so we can simply say sunnah and bid'ah they are two opposite poles they cannot be put together wherever there is sunnah bid'ah has to go away wherever there is bid'ah sunnah has to go away so what is bid'ah how do we define it and how it is connected to the ahkam we discuss these important issues in our today's talk the hadith is an umm al an umm al mu'minin umm abdullah aisha radhiyallahu anha qalat qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad rawahu al bukhari wa muslim wa fi riwayat wa fi riwayat li muslim man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad <coughs> the hadith is on the authority of our, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man amila amalan man ahdasa fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad whoever innovates something in this matter of matter of ours that is in deen and which is not of it will be rejected fa huwa rad will be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sharia and the wordings of muslim imam muslim has also recorded the hadith but there, there is a slight difference in the word wordings which is man uh, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad for that whoever performs any action which we have not commanded uh, will be rejected so these are the there are different other wordings of this hadith as well <coughs> The hadith is on the authority of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, and in this hadith, the epithet or the kunya, the title of Aisha radiallahu anha is mentioned, Ummu Abdullah. We know that the Prophet sallallahu taala sallam had children only from Khadija radiallahu anha. So how come uh, Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha came to be known as Ummu Abdullah? One thing is here. Uh, it's not necessarily that the arabs the tradition tradition of the arabs were 
that is, it was not necessary for a person to have a child and after the child he was using the epithet or this uh, title Abu or Ummu. Even the person without having any child could use this. This is one interpretation. Second is that Sayyidah Aisha Radhi she conceived and then she had the miscarriage. So the name of the child, the miscarried, miscarried child was given Abdullah. That's why she came to be known as Ummu Abdullah. And the third opinion is that uh, the nephew of Aisha Radhi his name was Abdullah. So she came to be known as, or she, she achieved this, she acquired this epithet after her nephew, whose name was Abdullah. So she came to be known as Ummu Abdullah. So these are three different opinions regarding her name, her epithet, Ummu Abdullah. Because this hadith mentions, an Ummi al-Mu'mineen, Ummi Abdullah, radiallahu ta'ala anha. <clears throat> as far as the children are concerned, it is unanimously that she was not having any child. And there was a hikmah behind it uh, to show to the people of the world that giving uh, to be blessed with the children is the sole domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whomever he wishes, he can bless a person either with a baby boy or the baby girl or with both or with none of them. It's all a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, Whomever he wishes, he blesses him with the, with the baby boys. And whomever he wishes, whomever he wishes, he blesses him with the baby girl. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the both. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprives of the both. So it is all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here the hadith is about, as I said, bid'ah. So what is bid'ah? Or how can we define it? <coughs> as far as this hadith is concerned, Ulama of Islam, they say, هذا الحديث أصل عظيم من أصول الإسلام This hadith is a foundation of Islam. Or this hadith is of the foundation of Islam. وهو كالميزان للأعمال في ظاهرها أحكام, they are having two parts. Apparent part, part and the hidden part. Apparent part means the physical part or the physical form of the ahkam. And hidden part is related to the intention and it is related to the niyyah. Innam al a'malu bin niyyat. Or there is another narration, al a'malu bin niyyat. That actions are known by the intentions. It covers the inner part, the hidden part of the action, which is not known to anyone except the person who is practicing it. So, hidden part is immensely important. And more important is the physical part. Of or apparent structure of the action. So this hadith, that hadith man ahdasa fi amrina hada or man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. This hadith is the foundation and this is kalmizan. It's like a yardstick. This hadith is like a tight stone for the amal as far as the apparent form is concerned. So it means that apparently any action, any deed, any act of worship. If it doesn't correspond to the to the prophetic sunnah, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, as prophet said, laysa alayhi amruna, where there is no command of ours, means we did not command of it. So as far as the apparent form is concerned, this hadith serves as a criterion for all forms, form, structure of the action. One is spirit of the action, soul of the action, and structure of the action. Two things are there. So structure means apparent form. Soul means inner intention. As far as the structure of action is concerned, structure of deed is concerned, apparent form of deed is concerned, this hadith serves as a criterion. So any action, any structure, any form, which is not derived from the sunnah, or which is against the sunnah, stands null and void, stands nullified. As the innam al amal bin it it serves criterion for the inner form, for the inner structure, or for the hidden form of the action. If the action is according to the sunnah, all the structure, all the form is according to the sunnah, but intention is corrupted. It is all null and void. It stands nullified. Though in dunya, 
is absolved of the responsibility of that particular action. On the part of the Sharia, there will be no demand. As we know that there are two parts. One is demand of Sharia. Second, when a person performs an action, Allah has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised a certain reward upon that action. If the intention is corrupted, one part is achieved. What part? That in dunya, the Sharia won't demand from that person to perform that action once again. Say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Aqimus Salah, you perform the Salah. So it's a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it has to be performed according to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the whole of the Quran, we don't find any verse which describes us how to perform the Salah. Quran gives a general ruling, Aqimus Salah, you perform the Salah. But there is no any practical ritual, there is no any practical description given in the Quran. So it is a hadith which describes and which tells us how to perform the Salah. What are the rituals? What are the integrals? What are the recommended, recommended parts? So if a person performs the Salah according to the Sunnah, however, intention is corrupted. So we, can say, we cannot say that he has, to, he has to resume the Salah. He has to perform the Salah once again because it stands null and void. No, actually it is nullification is in terms of reward. In terms of demand of Sharia, no, there'll be, there won't be any demand of Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us performing, to perform zakah, wa'atu zakah. So Quran gives us the command that you have to perform the zakah and there are asnaf, there are eight categories in which it has to be spent. However, Sharia, uh, Quran doesn't mention how much portion we have to take from, the, from our wealth or what portion is obligatory. Is a sunnah that tells us it is 2.5% upon the wealth. And the one, one year must have passed it upon the amount. So if a person is observing this structural form of the action, however his intention is corrupted, he wants to make riya, he wants to make show off. So in dunya, amal is accepted. There will be no demand on the part of the sharia. But as far as the intention is concerned, it is corrupted. There will be no reward upon this action in the Akhirah. So these are two pillars we can see, two pillars of the action. So one hadith in Amal Amal bin Niyat, it covers the hidden part. It co covers the inner part of the action, which is, or we can simply say, it, it encompasses the soul of the action. If there is no soul, it is all lifeless. So, soul of action is niya, intention, sincere intention, ikhlas, is a soul of the action. However, if soul is there, however a person is sincere enough, but if he does not perform the action according to the practice of the Prophet wasallam, still it is null and void. It won't be accepted. So, two things are important. One, the structural form, and second, the inner intention. These two things together makes the amal, makes the action perfect. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu, he said, لا ينفع قول إلا بالعمل No speech will benefit a person. However good things we speak to the people, it won't benefit unless and until we practice it. So that's what Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, لا ينفع قول إلا بالعمل No speech will help a person, no speech will benefit a person except when he practices it. So our speech needs to be practiced. Actions are louder than the speech. So many of us, we speak a lot about deen, but we fail to practice it. We fail to translate that into the action. So what Sharia demands from us, that whatever we say of the good, it has to be practiced. So, لا ينفع قول No speech will benefit a person إلا بالعمل Except when he practices it. So, قول and عمل Speech and action And then Sayyidina Abdul bin Masood says that لا ينفع قول ولا عمل No any speech of a person nor action of a person will benefit him except when there is sincere intention with it. So, third thing So, قول Speech Amal, practice, or action, and then niya, that is sincere intention. These are three integral part of the action. Kaulun, fi'alun, wa niyatun. 
So Sayyidina Abdullah bin Masood then says, Radiallahu anhu, La yanfaw qawlun wa la amalun wa la niyatun. No speech, nor any, nor any action, nor any good intention will help a person illa ma wafaqa sunnah. Until the action is according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So th- now we understand ex- speech, action, niyah, and then according to the sunnah. So any action which is not according to the sunnah, this hadith says, stands null and void, is rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the, the content of innovation, the content of bid'ah, it varies. If the, if the outright action, action in its, in its totality is based on bid'ah, that's altogether rejected. However, if there is an action which is approved by the Sharia, but some parts are added to it which are not approved by the Sharia, then the rulings are different. So we shall see it. Uh, Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he used to say in his khutbah, Astaqul hadithi kitabullah, the most truthful of speech is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa khayrul hadi hadiyu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And best of examples is that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sharrul umuri muhammad. Wa sharrul umuri muhdathatuha. And the worst of all affairs is, is innovations thereof. And there is a famous hadith on the authority of Sayyiduna Irbad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu. We are going to deal with this hadith later on. Imam, Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah has uh, collected this hadith as well in his anthology of 42 hadith. So we discuss it later on. The hadith is Sayyiduna Irbad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu narrates on the, that Prophet sallallahu ta'ala sallam has said Man ya'ish min kum ba'adi Whoever lives among you after me, he will see a lot of conflict. He will see a lot of clashes and conflicts. And in a state of conflicts, when people differ with one another, So it is mandatory upon you to follow my sunnah and the sunnah of my rightly guided caliphs after me. Addu alayha bin nawajiz. You must hold off it with your molar teeth. Wa iyyakum wa muhtasatil umur. And beware of the innovations. Fa inna kulla muhtasatim bid'ah. Because every innovative act is bid'ah. Wa kullu bid'atin dalala. And every bid'ah is a misguidance, is a clear error. And there is another hadith in which it is mentioned that Prophet sallallahu ta'ala sallam used to mention in his khutbah. Every innovative act, that every new action or every uh, innovative action is bid'ah, is, is bid'ah. But and every form of bid'ah, dalala, is an error, is a clear misguidance. But finnar. And every act of innovation or every act of misguidance will lead a person to Jahannam. So there are many of the hadiths. As far as this hadith is concerned, hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, in hadith there are two things. One is mantuq, second is mafhum. When we see the usul al-hadith, there are two terms used. <coughs> mantuq and mafhum. Mantuq means the actual text. Mafu means what we understand of the text. So we can say the uh, defined text and the derived text. Defined text is known as mantuq. It's from the nutq. Nutq means spoken word. Whatever we speak. So there is no any additional alteration. So uh, Shariheen, the commentators of the hadith, they say, فَهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ يَدُلُّ بِمَنْتُوقِهِ so as uh, according to the mantuq, the spoken words of the hadith are concerned, it leads us to the fact that ala anna kulla amalin laysa alayhi amru shari fahuwa mardud. That any, for, any action, any deed, any act which a person performs, and there is no command of the sharia, there is no command of the lawgiver, there is no command of the Prophet ﷺ regarding that particular issue, fahuwa mardud, it is all rejected. It stands null and void. And second is mafhum. So this is a clear word. 
man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna whoever performs any action we didn't command off whoever performs any action we didn't command off fa huwa rad it is rejected so this is mantuq the clear words the spoken words of the prophet clearly mention this thing and mafhum what we understand out of it mafhum mukhalafa so it mean that whatever prophet commands us whatever prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibits us whatever prophet sallallahu taala alaihi wasallam tells us to do so it has to be done it has to be performed so two opposite meanings whatever prophet didn't command off it has it is rejected whatever it means that whatever he commands it has to be practiced that's what quran says wa ma ataakum ar-rasul fa khuduhu whatever prophet gives you you take it you take it firmly wa ma nahaakum anhu fantahu and whatever prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibits you you stay away from it you abstain from it and there is a hadith which which is also having the almost the same meaning as that of this verse of the quran prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam whatever i give you you take it firmly whatever i prohibit you from you must stay away from it so this hadith in its mantuq and in its mafhum it tells us that prophet is a criterion prophet is the is the yardstick in all amal and actions what is criterion with us is a prophet muhammad sallallahu taala alaihi wasallam fala wa rabbika la yu'minuna hatta yuhakkimuka fi ma shajara bainahu allah subhanahu wa taala says in the quran that fala wa rabbik never i take oath of your lord allah takes his oath in reference to his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to show the importance and significance of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah simply could have said i take oath of my own i take oath of myself but allah says fala wa rabbik indeed i take oath of your lord o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam la yu'minun their iman is not established there is their iman is not accepted their iman is not established hatta until you hakimu ka fi ma shajara bainahum they make you as a yardstick they make you as arbitrator they make you the final judge in all their affairs and conflicts at many places allah subhanahu wa taala says in the quran ati allah wa ati ar rasul this unconditional obedience to allah and to his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of the verses in surah an-nisa allah subhanahu wa taala says ati allah wa ati ar rasul wa ulil amri minkum fa in tanazatum shay'in fi shay'in farudduhu ila allah wa rasulihi ati allah obey allah wa ati ar rasul and obey messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa ulil amri minkum and men and you and men of authority among you Here Allah did not mention wa ati u ulil amri minkum and you obey the man of authority among you it refers to the scholars and fuqaha so the first two things are unconditional obedience has to be given unconditional obedience has to be uh, 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 unconditional obedience has to be established for Allah for his messenger sallallahu taala alaihi wasallam however the third element third component is fuqaha and scholars Allah also commands us to follow them but their, their their adherence is conditional as long as they follow Allah and his messenger it is obligation upon us to follow the scholars to follow the fuqaha however when they deviate from the path of Allah and path of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it means there is no obligation upon us to follow such scholars unconditional adherence and obedience has to be shown and has to be given to only Allah and his messenger rest of them rest besides allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam all our obedience is conditional sayyidina uh, abu bakr as-siddiq radhiyallahu anhu when he assumed the office of khilafa when he became the khalifa when he was appointed as a caliph by the sahaba unanimously by all the sahaba ridwanullah taala alayhim ajma'in so he he stood and he delivered a khutbah in his khutbah Sayyidina Abu Bakr As-Siddiq radhiyallahu anhu he said ati'uni you follow me ma atatu Allah wa rasula you follow me as long as i follow Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa in ziqtu if i deviate from the path 
فقوموني then bring me on the right path show me the right path so prophet sallallahu ta'ala is the center of our constitution we can say as quran is our constitution so is the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam our constitution that's why we say quran and sunnah they are not two separate sources of islam they are twin sources of islam and opposite to sunnah is bid'ah that's why prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took a strong note of the bid'ah and warned his ummah lest they fall prey to it because shaitan is is, is very intelligent and he knows he knows very well how to how to turn the tables over he has he has an experience of hundreds and thousands of years he encountered many of the messengers of allah 124000 messengers of allah and then sahaba of all messengers he encountered prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and the sahaba so he knows the tricks and traps how to deviate us so bid'ah is established again as a sunnah so this hadith the meaning of the hadith is man kana amaluhu kharijan an ash-shar'i whoever performs any action which is not approved by the sharia laysa tufahu mardud laysa muttaqidan muttaqidan bi shar the one who doesn't follow the commandments of the sharia fahu mardud it is all rejected so it means is this hadith is an, is an indication that all our ahkam should be under the command of the sharia all our ahkam all our deeds all our actions all our acts must be under the under the supervision of the sharia and sharia should be decisive in all our affairs no our sentiments our feelings our passion it it, it doesn't carry any importance in front of the sharia So the hadith is establishing Sharia as a scale for our actions, as a yardstick for our for all our deeds. And uh, so, whatever is according to the Sharia, it is accepted. Whatever is against the Sharia, it is rejected by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So no action will be accepted, which which goes against the demands of the Sharia, and all forms of actions will be accepted, which goes in line with the Sharia. سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته